I'd like to welcome all of you to worship this morning, whether you're worshiping online or on the Wink Radio, and we're glad to have you with us. We had a great beginning to our youth programming for this fall this past Wednesday. We had 25 or so young people gathered around fire pits uh, for confirmation and for youth group fire pits in our courtyard. And so we had a great start to our fall. And uh, keep in mind, this coming Wednesday at 6.30, we again meet for confirmation and youth group in our courtyard area. Also gathering again for the fall is a Thursday morning women's Bible study, 6.30 a.m. in the morning. And I talked to Carmen Galton about to lead that group, and it's BYOBBB. Bring your own breakfast, beverage, and Bible. 6.30 on Thursday mornings. Uh, women of American Lutheran are welcome to that. Keep in mind, next Sunday, September 27th, we'll be worshiping in our parking lot 10 in the morning, as we will this coming Sunday, but 10 in the morning, and we'll be having communion. So September 27th, last Sunday of the month, we'll be having communion together at parking lot worship at 10 a.m. We will continue to keep in our prayers Bruce and Terry Steele, Dolores Kemble, and Don Erickson as they struggle with various health issues. And we also welcome, again, all listening in our radio audience, our broadcast today is sponsored to the glory of God. These are announcements, and I'll give you a few moments to prepare your hearts and minds for worship. We begin with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us now live in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now listen to our opening hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, 733, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
who show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We listen now to I Have Not Seen, sung by Barbara Lenny. has not seen, ear has not heard, what God has ready for those who love him. Spirit of love, come give us the mind of Jesus. Teach us the wisdom of God. When pain and sorrow weigh us down, be near to us, O oh Lord. Forgive the weakness of our faith and bear us up within your peaceful word. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God ready for those who love him. Spirit of love, come give us the mind of Jesus. Teach us the wisdom of God. Our lives are but a single breath. We flower and we fade. Yet all our days are in your hands, so we return in love what love has made. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, what God has ready for those who love him, Spirit. Just the wisdom of God. To those who see with eyes of faith, the Lord is ever near, reflected in the faces of all the poor and lowly of the world. I have has not seen, ear has not heard, what God has ready for those who love him. Spirit of love, come give us the mind of Jesus. Teach us the wisdom. Our first reading is from the prophet Jonah. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I know that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city, and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush, made it come up over Jonah, to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush, so that it withered. When 
the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down the head of Jonah so that he was faint, and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in the night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals. The word of, the word of God, the word of life. Thanks be to God. And now we read Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God and my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. There is no end to your greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your power. I will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and all your marvelous works. They shall tell of the might of your wondrous acts, and I will recount your greatness. They shall publish the remembrance of your great goodness. They shall sing joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Saying, go at once to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, 
for their wickedness has come before me. So, we know that from 2 Kings, Jonah is actually a court prophet. He had already told King Jeroboam II that God would extend his reign beyond its already reach. Imagine the great reception that got him as a court prophet. You go to the king and say that he'll stay in power and he'll gain more power. You bring good news to those who are already living a good life. Being a prophet sounds like a good gig. It's good to be Jonah. And then, as always, you get to other duties as assigned. God said, go once to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against their wickedness. God said to Jonah, leave the court where you told the powerful they would be more powerful, and go to the city of Nineveh, the well-known hotbed of heathenism. Declare it sinful, tell them to repent. Nineveh, to Jonah, was clearly the other. No one wanted to go there, to those people. Aren't you our God? Shouldn't you be worried about us? What do we care about them and their fate? Why should I give a second thought, and certainly any of my time, to those people? Jonah wasn't having it. God said, go. Jonah said, no thing. So Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish in the presence of the Lord. Tarshish might be so far away as Spain. Imagine that you are at the shores of Israel and he was trying to get as far away as he could and Tarshish is what he thought of. So he found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid his fare, went on board to go along with them, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. When the mariners were afraid, they cried out to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship to the sea to light it for them. But Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. The captain came to him and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up and call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us as a thought so we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots too, so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. They said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is it that you have done? For the men knew he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them so. Jonah's own knowledge of God has already betrayed his attentions. Here he is out in the middle of the sea, and they're worried in the storm, and he tells the others, his God, is the God who made the sea and the dry land. Who made the sea and the dry land, but here he is on the sea thinking he can outrun the God who created it. How can we escape that God? So then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that the great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode large and the ship back to land. But they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it has pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered the sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. There it is, despite his own best efforts to outrun the Lord's command, even before 
Jonah reaches dry land? He's already a bearer of God's grace. He's converted others on the boat. They're now praying, too, to his God. You think he'd catch on that God is intent on using him and that you can't escape that. And yet, God being who God is, the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then, in the book of Jonah, he blabbers on a long prayer of the belly of the fish. My Bible titles it, A Psalm of Thanksgiving. It includes lines like, As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. There's a pro proclamation, Deliverance belongs to the Lord. All spoken by a man who's doing everything in his power to escape God. Spoken by a man who would rather die being tossed over a ship than doing the work God cast him in. Spoken by a man who has decided that other people aren't worthy of that same deliverance that he's praying. Spoken by a man who was saved by nothing of his own doing and actually in spite of his own fervent efforts to the contrary. A psalm of praise. But how authentic was it in the belly? Yet, God being who God is, then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days' walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, doing a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh should be overthrown. That's it. That's the whole prophecy. That's all he can muster after being saved by a fish, after his long, flowery, heartfelt psalm of thanksgiving in the belly of that fish. Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What a prophecy. He was still resisting the idea that those people should be God's people. He could muster up the bare minimum of prophecy, but he couldn't offer them any good news. Just 40 days before Nineveh, Nineveh should be overthrown. He wanted them to get what was coming to them. The belly of the whale, the deliverance he had known, should be preserved for more holy people, the worthy people like him. You know the one who tried to run away and spit out some words of praise and gave the least possible effort to the life-sharing, life-giving good news God asked him to share? Jonah still wanted to watch their ruin and not witness their resurrection. Yet, God being who God is, and the people of Nineveh believed God, they proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. No human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. But that was very displeasing to Jonah. Remember, he wanted to witness their ruin and not the resurrection. He couldn't stand that these awful people are now also God's people. He wanted his version of justice. He deemed their repentance as inauthentic and a little bit showy. It came too easily to them.
and God forgave them too easily for Jonah's liking. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is that not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishment. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life for me. For me, it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and he made a booth for himself there and he sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. Jonah said it himself, For I know that you are gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And here again, the God, Jonah knows the God he's working for. He knows this is the one who created the sea and the dry lands. He knows this is the one who's abounding in steadfast love. This is the God he believes in and serves. And yet, he still meant that this God who is slow to anger at him is also slow to anger at the other guy. He's not so sure he likes that God who's about making his steadfast love for them, too. And yet, God being who God is, the Lord appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm to attack him so that it was withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And again, asked that he might die. He said, again, it's better for me to die than to live. Because Jonah was quick to name the sinless of Nineveh. He could see all their faults and failures. He had no way to reflect on the wickedness of his own heart. He couldn't stand that God didn't see right from wrong as he did. That those people were breaking the rules and deserved to pay for it. And in one way he was right. By all standards, Nineveh did deserve what should have been coming. They had failed the law, they were outside of prudence, they were dwelling in immorality. They by all outside observers, deserved wrath. But wrath was replaced with grace. Ruin replaced with resurrection. It didn't make sense to Jonah. And if it didn't make sense to him, he didn't want any part of it. How do you win in a system that wasn't set up for winners and losers? How do you gain power in a system that regards all of equality, and how can you claim victory if everyone gets a shot at redemption? But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in the night. Should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't move their right hand from their left? And also many animals. And yet, despite what Jonah may want and despite what we may want, God being who God is, God is the God of resurrection and not ruin. My study Bible put it beautifully. It said, In this story we encounter a God who is indeed concerned about social injustice. But who, in the mystery of God's ways, permits the sovereignty of the divine heart to overrule the requirements of divine justice? And the mystery of God's ways permits the sovereignty of the divine heart to overrule the requirements of divine justice. Jonah is so angry about the people 
grace shown to the people of Nineveh that he doesn't know the lesson is actually for him. Jonah misses that this isn't a story of their redemption. God the Father Almighty, 
creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the Church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Gracious God, in our life in your church, help us to hear the sweet sounds of amazing grace. And like Jonah, remind us that your ways are not our ways, that you are a God slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for your church. During these challenging times, help us to be a people who proclaim your good news in new and different ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we pray for those in the path of fires or hurricanes or other natural disasters. Bless and protect firefighters, first responders, and all who are in harm's way. Comfort and sustain all who have suffered losses. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healing God, we pray for the sick and the grieving. Praying especially for Bruce and Terry Steele, Dolores Campbell, Don Erickson, for all our prayers, and for those we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for healing in our community, our nation, and our world. Amidst the restrictions of life and the pandemic, strengthen us to do our part to protect the vulnerable and love our neighbor. Where there is brokenness, grant us your peace. Where there is division, we pray for listening ears and open hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Trusting in your mercy and goodness, we bring before you these prayers and whatever else you see that we need. In the name of the one who sets us free, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We now pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We remind you at this time that you respond to God's generosity with their own gifts of gratitude to the church. 
church for the good of the work in the world. You can give either mailing your offerings or at amluth.org. Thank you for your continuing support. And now receive a blessing. The Holy Three, the Holy One, increase your hope, strengthen your faith, deepen your love, and grant you peace. Amen. We listen now to our sending song, His Mercy is More, sung by our praise team. Since they are men. 